Welcome, fair people of YouTube. Today I bring you the first episode of new series, the card review of Tempest of the Gods, the latest expansion that will be coming to Shadowverse probably this month or very early April. Today joining me will be Luis de Panda. Uh, hi, how's it going? Thanks for having me, Roxas. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And you know, I, you didn't guys really like the monologue series when I was doing review for the Rise of the Bahamut, so this season we are doing the conversation style. Alright, so we'll be jumping straight into it. Our first guide to review is Gravekeeper Sonia. So this is a Heavencraft class card that is 5 mana, 3, 4, with Ward, and from the fanfare, if there are no other followers, only allied followers, in play this follower will gain plus 1 attack and cannot be damaged by spells and effects. So you can still kill it with a heart removal like Dance of Death, but you cannot kill it with Revelation, you cannot kill it with like Serpent Wrath. I know nobody plays that, but yeah. And so Louis, what do you think about this card? I think it's pretty good as Haven, like even if you don't get the effect, a 3-5 ward is like okay, decent. And the effects is pretty easy to get as you usually like will have amulets. So you probably won't have other dudes, you'll get the effect, and not being able to be damaged by spells uh, seems pretty relevant when Rune is like one of the top classes. Yeah, Rune is actually the top class. <laughs> so, yeah, and what do you think about like this effect plays on this exact mana cost? Because a 5 mana cost is actually very relevant as if you are going first, this is your first play into the Evolution Wars. Yeah, I think the stats are okay. I don't, like, I don't feel like the card is insane or anything, but it might see play in some sort of like new, maybe, like, tempo game in deck or something like that. Yeah, actually on the last tournament I casted, we had uh, Nobi420, who is a dedicated Heaven main. He was bringing the midrange Heaven with no win condition. No Seraph, no Elena, just midrange Heaven. And he actually got to the, I believe, Loser's Finals, and that's where he fell. Yeah, that's a little weird, but I, I could see a card like this being good in a deck like that. Yeah, and do we have anything else to say? Well, in Constructed, because that's basically what we're talking about right now, uh, the card will probably not fit any decks like Seraph or something, because your turn 5 is already pretty stacked. This is the biggest problem of Heaven. Their turn 5 is already Radiance Angel and Spirit of the Ancient Lion, or Ancient Lion Spirit, one of these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so do you, let's compare this card to those two. Do you think it's better than any of the current ones? I don't see you playing this or Ancient Lion Spirit, who I think is absolutely insane. The two damage AV is just so incredibly good. So, would you play Lion Spirit and Sonya? I'm not sure that you'd have the room, but if you are playing a mid-range Haven, then I guess having a lot of fire drops would be okay. So, you say you would probably cut the Radiance Angel for it? Radiance Angel is also really good as well, that's the other thing, yeah. But, I mean, I feel like that's more for like if you're trying to like heal, like maybe an Elena, something like that. I don't know, I mean, it is a really good card though, you get heal and card draw. Yeah, but if you play on the mid range deck, maybe you will go away without drawing and just playing a big drop every single turn. That's how mid range decks basically function. Yeah. Alright, and how do you think? Is it arena viable? The answer is pretty obvious. Yeah, the arena is really good. <laughs> yeah, really. the only downside is this is silver, so you will not be getting that this often, but whenever you get it, I would probably say you pick it over the uh, Radiance Angel every single time, on arena at least. Yeah, over Radiance Angel, yeah, but not over the Lion's. Spirit. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you here completely. Yeah. Alright, the, the next card is Tristan of the Round Table. This is a bronze follower for Swordcraft with the trait Commander. And this is actually a pretty unique uh, interaction here because from far far, if an allied Commander is in play, gain last word, summon a Tristan of the Round Table. So he will basically resummon itself, but only once after it dies because it's fanfare, right? Fanfars do not activate unless you play it from your hand. And the unique interaction I'm talking about is, this is Commander depending on other Commanders. Alright, so Luis, what do you think about this card? Well, first of all, the fact that it's a Commander might not be a good thing, because a lot of Sword decks what they're doing now is that they want so their only Commander that they play is Albert, so that she can uh, make and get anything to pull it, right? Yeah, that's so a we have a card here that's a Commander that needs a Commander, that is weird, like you say, 
and the uh, the benefit that you get from it is okay. Like you get an R34, which is pretty good, but with Sword having so many good five drops like Albert, Aurelia, Monica, even Blader, I see no room for this guy to be played. Sadly. Yeah, I think in constructed. I mean, the good thing about it being the commander is that you can build a deck that is very focused on having a commander on the board. Like, this is the only deck I see that this card would be played in. And then again, why not just play Banner then? Because this is probably the only deck that's focused on having on Commander on the board. Right. So, yeah, you, you actually kind of opened my eyes because I liked this card before, but... As you say, the Commander trait is actually a bad thing here. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, but like, like I said, Sword is so overloaded with good 5 drops. There's so many 5 drops you have to play already because, like... You have to play Triple Albert, and then you probably play an Aurelia, either Monica or even Blader, things like Cyclone Blade. I just don't see the room for it in the 5 slot. Yeah, but on the other hand, in Arena, this card is crazy good. Yeah, I feel like in Arena it's good. I don't know about crazy good, because like, having a commander might be harder since you know, you're know you also drafting like neutral minions, but if you get the effect of it, it's pretty good, yeah. Yeah, it's basically 6-8 worth of stats. Well. That's not you cannot really compare it this way, but it will deal three damage two times guaranteed, and it will take eight damage to destroy it. So it's basically a six eight for five if you get the commander on the board. Yeah, if you get the effect of it, will be pretty solid. All right. So the next card, the goblin zombie. I I'm not sure if this should actually be named goblin zombie or zombie goblin. <laughs> All right. Anyway, the minion for shadowcraft. 3 mana to 3, at the end of your turn use Necromancy 4 to gain plus 2 plus 2. So what's your opinion, Ulysses? Let's start with you this time. Okay, well first of all, it's a 3 play from 2, 3, which are, you know, fine stats. The problem is by turn 3 you are not going to have 4 shadows, more than likely. So it's going to be like a vanilla minion. And later on in the game when you will have the shadows, the Necromancy, you want it to be going to other stronger effects, things like Death Spread, stuff like that. Yeah, full and Tempest. And even in this card, it happens at the end of your turn, not at the start of your turn when you play it. So that means that you can't like play it as a 4-5 and trade like you would. So it's just a little awkward, I feel like. Yeah, it's kind of awkward, but... On Arena, on the other hand, it's crazy good. Let me start with Arena. So basically, 3-mana uh, 2-3s on Arena are crazy good, because Arena is very heavily stacked on 2-drops. Two 2-drops two are the most versatile minions in the game. Uh, because you can feed them easily on the higher curve and they have enough value to actually compete in the late game uh, not like one drops and this guy ha is a very solid 3 mana 2 3 with a very solid effect because on arena you don't have uh, any means of spending your shadows usually there is not a lot of bronzes and silvers with good necromancy that you want to pick so any counter arguments Lewis? I just don't like that the buff happens at the end of your turn because if you could trade with as a four or five with it, it'd be pretty good. But but then the it would just be weird. But then it would not be necromancy four because uh, necrom necromancy gain plus two plus two is six necromancy, and if it was at the start of your turn, because of the like easier way to code it, it would probably be necromancy six. It would be yeah. on fanfare and at the start of your turn. So then it would it may be too many shadows. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a bad card, but I don't really like it either. Yeah, and what do we have right now for 3 mana uh, slot in Shadow? Because this thing is overflowed, overflow right now, overflooded. I I am bad at English. In constructed? Yeah. I don't see this being played constructed. No, I mean, there's like Spartoy Soldier or like Death Chaser maybe. I guess like. Uh... Yeah, Death Chaser is probably the closest comparison. Yeah. But I don't see it playing in Constructed. I think there's better things too with your Shadows. Yeah, there is also Rabbit Necromancer, uh, the Skeleton Knight, the Bone Chimera, and yeah, it is basically... And now we got also lately the uh, the Attendant. Yeah, also the uh, the Fair Patroller is not bad either. And I think that's a way better use of the Shadows too. Yeah, so overall this card gets pretty low score from us, I think. Yeah. It's very playable on Arena because uh, you get 3 mana 2 3 and that's already good enough. And you even get additional effect, but then again, if you have like powerful effects like Death's Breath on Arena, you don't want this card because it will eat your shadows without any control. 
and you may never ever get to play the Death's Breath with Necromancy Spider or Beam. So this is a card for right, so Bloodcraft, Necromancy. my favorite class probably. And it's a 2 mana 1 4, so stats are incredibly good. With a ward, so this is like insane. This is basically 1 mana cheaper card. Because 3 mana 1 4 is a standard, right? We have the Shield Angel. The downside is fanfare, deal to damage to your leader if Vengeance is not active for you. So, maybe because it's blood, I would love to start with it. I hope you are okay with it, Luis. Ah, uh, yes, please go ahead. So, basically, this card says, I don't care about fairies and bats anymore until the end of the time. These tokens just will never get through it. You play it on two, summon Bloodkin, doesn't matter. Fairy Circle on one, doesn't matter. Elf Plus May, doesn't matter. Th nothing matters, and you just lose 2 HP. Like, getting. Uh, Losing 2 HP is usually equal to 1 mana, exception is uh, the scratchy scratchy, the Razory Claw, uh, which gives you basically 2 mana because it's Demonic Strike, but only for 2 mana. And yeah, this ward is great, it also will not damage you if you are already in the Vengeance, so it's also a very good last result card versus aggro cards. Any, any arguments against it, Luis? No, I think it's good, like you were saying, like, the fact that it's, it has a stat of a 3 playable minion for 2, which is obviously pretty good. Uh, the drawback of the into damage is not that big a deal, and I think every time you play this, you'll probably save yourself 2 life anyway, so it, like, equals out. I think it's good that you can play this minion on turn 2, where, like, it won't be evil over so easily, right? So, I think it's pretty solid. Oh, yeah, it... The concern is whether there will be room for this in whatever blood deck you're trying to play, probably a slower blood deck, but... I'm not sure. I saw a lot of people saying that it actually might be good in aggro, just because he has such good stats. Yeah, it, it definitely is good in aggro. And uh, maybe we'll get some good uh, attack buffs in blood. Maybe something like Wind God with this card. Maybe something like Cheaper Wind God will be, will be introduced, like Blessed Fairy Dancer. That would be mm -hmm. great with this card. And in Arena? In Arena is going to be just good. Again, like. You know, Arena's a lot of times just a battle of the stats, and you're playing three worth of stats for two, so that's just good. Yeah, and two, two life doesn't really matter in Arena. Mm -hmm. Rough Drake. So, right, so, 5 mana 4-4 for four, four Dragoncraft, as the name might hint you. It will deal one damage to all other followers on the fanfare, so including your followers. And if you pay three more mana for it, it will actually do three damage instead, so for three mana you get two damage AoE. What do you think, Luis? Let's let you start with this card. So the uh, the deal one damage to our followers is like a pretty common effect in Dragon. It's essentially Dragon Wings, which cost two play points. Uh, you see that effect in things like the uh, the Glacial Dragon stuff like that. Now the thing is, right now in the meta, dual one AOE damage is not that great. You want to be doing two AOE damage, but of course the meta is going to shift. So you know, if the one damage is better, then this card will be better. But uh, right now, it's it seems okay. 5, 4, 4, not bad stats, solid effect, and if you enhance, you're doing 3 damage, which is actually pretty solid. Uh, at that point, though, you're playing 8 for a 3 damage AoE, which is good. It's like people weren't really playing Fafnir before, though, so would you play this on top of that, or, like, instead of it? I could see Dragon X playing, like, maybe it is a 1-off or something, but I'm not sure. I mean, it, it's not a bad effect. Yeah, and chance uh, effect is definitely solid, and as you said, we don't have that many bats and fairies, and even bats aggro and fairies aggro now play a lot of goblin-like minions with 2 health. Yes. So, uh, if you compare this to Fafnir, this card is probably better than Fafnir, but it's still not that good, not as good as Bahamut. Right. Yeah, and it's pretty close on mana, because like, turn 8 or turn 10, it's usually a difference of one ramp card. Maybe two. And yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure if this will see playing Constructed. I mean, 5 mana 4-4, uh, four, four. you can play it on turn 7 together with the Wild Hunt, the execution effect from Hearthstone. Yeah. But nobody plays that. Yeah, nobody <laughs> but, really plays but that. But that matters on Arena, where this card is actually pretty solid, because on Arena you want to be trading a lot. And this card will allow you some... Uh, some uptrades with your smaller minions that for example if your opponent plays a 4-4 four, four and you played you had a 3-2 on a board you can trade a 3-2 play rough drake and you will basically trade for your 3-drop for a tiger 
Yeah, and arena is really good. AOE is just good in arena, and this is good AOE, so it's good in arena. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty pretty self-explanatory. All right, next card we will talk about is Crystallia Erin. So another one of Crystallias. Now we actually have, I believe, four of them, including the token of Eve. And this card is a gold for Forest Craft. For six mana, you get four six ward, and you heal for three. If you play this for 8 mana on enchants instead, you will also recover 1 evolution point. So I will start with because I am I am the Rose Queen player, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody who knows me knows I am fanatic of Rose Queen and I try to make her what in every single meta. And this card immediately screams Rose Queen as a control deck. So 6 mana for 6 ward is very solid, especially when it gives you 3 more health. You can read it as a 6 mana for 9 ward. And the biggest problem is that it shares the play point cost with Fairy Beast, which is also a health recovery card. And you may even replace the Fairy Beast with Erin, because how I see at that, how I look at that is if you actually count this as a 6 mana for 9, because it saves you 9 HP in total, at least, or not really, at yeah, it saves you at least 9 HP or a hard removal which is usually expensive. And Fairy Beast can heal you at top for 8. So basically how I see that is if there is a lot of heart removal in meta, Fairy Beast is in play. If there is a lot of minion pressure in meta, Crystallia Erin is better. How do you see that, Louis? Yeah, I think it's pretty clear to compare it to Fairy Beast, which is already a pretty good card. I think Aaron is it's good. I mean, it's good stat and he has ward, so it's a little more defensive in that it fights the board. If you're looking for a raw healing, then obviously Fairy Beast is better, though, right? Uh, Aaron also has the enhanced effect, which gives you a new point, which is actually pretty good. If you think about that, you're paying extra two play points for an evolution, which is like rush and plus two plus two. It's gonna fight the board well, which is ideally what the card wants to do, right? Would yeah. you play a deck that plays both Aaron and Fairy Beast? I don't know, but. I mean, I think it definitely has a lot of potential. That would probably fit in the hand forest. If that becomes a thing, yeah. I yeah. would love to see a control forest. Yeah, and uh, as you said, you actually can evolve it immediately if you play it for 8 and count this as a 8 mana 6 8 rush heal yeah. for 3. And that is some really hard drop for bot control. But the problem is, well, I mean, for me at least. You cannot play this in a Rose Queen deck as easily, I mean the enchant effect, because on turn 8 you want to drop Rose Queen. Yeah. And you actually get the enchant for 2 mana, so if you evolve it immediately, you get plus 2 plus 2 and rush for 2 mana. There is one card that gives plus 2 plus 2 for and rush for 4 mana actually, the, the bloody axe for the blood. You know, I'd say you could compare this to Lucifer, in the case that Lucifer is a 8 play point 6, 7, heal 4, that doesn't rush, right? Huh. But for here, you have a 6, 8 with rush that heals you for 3 instead of 4, but it has ward too, right? And it doesn't really cost you an evolution point because you get it, so like... Lucifer is already... I think Lucifer is absolutely insane, really, really good. And this card, on paper, seems pretty strong as well, right? Yeah, it's actually as good as Lucifer, it's not better. It kills you only once, but then it has ward, as you said, so... Yeah. Huh, I see, so if you play Control Forest, you may consider playing this over the Lucifer? Yeah, or maybe you play Fairy Beast as a 6 and you play this as an 8 drop, that you could play on 6, I mean, it seems solid. Yeah, that would actually allow you to cut Lucifer and go on a lower curve. And there is one last thing I want to talk about this before we move to Arena value, and that is, what do you think about this with possible Wolf, maybe... I mean, the White Wolf, right? Yeah, I think there's maybe better things to get out of the Wolf, because I feel like the Wolf is like, you want to win the game out of it with like a Zero Cost Bolt or like Rose Queen, right? Uh, Arian would be nice, but it's not game winning. Yeah, or Homecoming, but it could be on plan B, like you could play Bolt Bolt, and then play this as your only 6 drop, so you get it with Wolf if you didn't, if you drew your both Bolts before you drew the Wolf. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, yeah. it wouldn't be horrible for zero play points, but the enhance would make it cost 8 anyway, so... Yeah, you are right here, so... Actually, that would be troublesome. So this is not the best wolf card. No, not at all. Alright. And in Arena? 
do you think it's worth it? Because in Arena, value is overall the most important thing, and yeah. this gives you some value, it gives you the evolution point. No, I mean, it's definitely good in Arena, but like, maybe you would rather take a different gold. Yeah, you can have golds like Petal Fence, so... I mean, you definitely take it over something like that, right? But like, there's some good cards in Arena that like, like Silver Bolt can like end games, or like, uh, Titania Sanctuary can be surprisingly good in Take 2, so... I don't know, I mean, it's definitely a solid card. Yeah, I, I think I would give it a 5 out of 10 in Arena. Don't really like it. How about you? No, I mean, it, it's solid, like... It's just a good minion arena, right? It's good stats, the heal is relevant, the ward is relevant, they will point is relevant, so I, I think it's good. I think it's better than that. Better than that. Alright, yeah, I, I think if you play it on Enchants, it's actually gold. a bit so better. So this is our yeah. new gold for right, so next up we have another At 6 mana you transfer all enemy followers into flame rats. Now, what we think that flame rats do, because... Uh, I don't believe there has been an official confirmation on that yet. Although we've seen some leaks, but I'm not even sure if these were official leaks. I believe there were official Japanese leaks, but there may be some translation error and so so. Uh, don't take my word for the, uh, you know, the truth, guys, the absolute truth. But the flame rats are the one-one tokens that deal one damage to both leaders at the start of the turn and you only transform your opponent uh, rats, so basically at the start of your opponent turn, you will deal one damage for each follower they had to both faces. So how do you think, Luis? Is it is it viable? I It's a weird card. Like, first of all, I'd like to say the uh, a transform effect is pretty strong, as we don't have like a sound mechanic in this game, right? Yeah. So transform will let you deal with last word minions, things like Mordecai, stuff like that. So that those effects tend to be pretty strong, I would say. And you don't see into it, right? So that's strong. It's also AOE transform, not just transform one board. So it's also good. Uh, the flame rats are like one ones, and if they deal one damage at the start of the turn, that means that this card could be like one phase damage for everyone they have, and that's not bad either, right? If you transform one of uh, Daria board into rats, that's like five phase damage, which is might be what you need to end the game or something. So I think like the the effects are strong. I don't know if the card is good enough for we'll see player or not, though, but I do think the effect is strong. Alright, so... Uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree that the card is not really strong, because we have a 5 mana Winter Caprice that transfers yep. everything into Snow Golems, the Snowmans, mm -hmm. and it's not really widely played. I, I don't think I ever saw a competitive deck with this one card. <laughs> and That's a good point. Yeah, and this card is one mana more expensive, but only targets your opponent followers. So maybe if you maybe I, I actually see one deck. There is one meme deck that would play this card, and that is Snowman Agro with Penguin. <laughs> you see, you let's say your opponent played White Paladin and evolved it <laughs> on your full board of Snowmen. You transform yeah. everything, you basically take the ward against from them, I mean, uh, you take the ward from them, and you also deal 5 damage to their face. Yeah. And it's turn <laughs> 6, so that is actually probably lethal. Yeah, I don't know, I mean, it, <laughs> like I said, the effect is strong, but you're right, Mooncapture is not played at all, so why would this be, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, the only deck I see this played in is the deck where actually you care about your board, so that is only the aggro rune. Yeah, I would like to see a rune deck that is not aggro and not like D shift. I would like to see like a control rune as a control player. I would like to see that. So yeah, you, then, I don't know how they would play this. You already have your uh, dart rune, right? You play the. Yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, uh, remind me the name, please. It was the Kimi Mari Shuffle, something like that. Ah, uh, yeah, Kimi Mari Shuffle. Kimi Mari Shuffle, yeah. Uh, Alright, so, yeah, overall, not really great card. On Arena, I think this is even worse. I mean, it's a solid removal, but it's a gold. And you are looking for Yunos, you are looking for Ancient Alchemists, you are looking for Annabelle, and stuff like that. Yeah, I think you would more than likely pass it up in Take 2. Unless your other option is uh, Arcane Enlightenment or stuff like that. <laughs> 
But you probably take most of the legendaries over these two. Like, Runecraft doesn't oh, yeah. have that many bad legendaries. The Merlin is only questionable uh, one on Arena. And usually it's even draw to cards, because you cannot go without picking any spell boost in Arena unless you are really lucky. Yeah, no, I, I don't see you taking this over any legendary. <laughs> yeah. Alright, so overall a pretty weird card. The same tier as the, the Winter Cup is, so is the one and only Zeus, the, meme, the yeah. legendary god, <laughs> yeah. the 10 drop, the 10 mana 510 with Storm, Bane, Ward, and basically you can even add Rush to that because Storm includes Rush, so a lot of effects, a lot of stats, a lot of mana costs. Is it a lot of value though, Luis? Uh, I don't like Zeus. Uh, that being said, I don't think it's a bad card. My problem is that Okay, well, let me split this in two ways, as I did for my people. So from a game design perspective, I think it's boring, because the way they made him interesting is just slap a bunch of keywords on him, and I don't think that's that great or like interesting, right? It's more boring. Uh, you can compare it to the other land areas like Olivia and Bahamut, who have like crazy unique effects that are really fun, really cool, and they feel unique, you know? So on their hand, like all minions, or like a lot of minions, Storm, Bane, or Ward, so it's kind of boring. And then from the gameplay perspective, like, I mean, it, it's not bad, like a 5-10 Storm Rain Ward. It, it's good, but, like, the way I see it, he's a, a Jack of All Trades, Master of None. I, I keep making a comparison where if you want to go face with a neutral, Gilgamesh is the same thing, but costs two less. And if you're trying to fight the board, a.k.a. Zeus Trade, then I feel like you might as well just Bahamut, who just clears everything, right? Yes. The, Upside is that he has ward, I guess. I mean, are you playing a 10 play point ward minion in your deck? I feel like for 10 play point, the minions better win the game. So I don't know. Yeah, and one thing I want to point out, because uh, there is one thing I disagree with, but I maybe kind of agree because you actually say that the ward is good on this Zeus. And I want to dig this topic a bit more. Because the ward is actually uh, a crucial keyword on Zeus, because if your board is empty, let's say your opponent played the Bahamut and you actually managed to kill the Bahamut, they didn't have another threat, so they just passed it a turn, maybe healed up or something like that. You can play the Zeus and that's defensive proactive play. You can actually deal some damage phase and set up this huge ward that won't be played and, I mean, what won't be uh, pretty much possible to get through without hard removal or a lot of traits. And... Or, of course, a Bane, right? A Spectre can kill Zeus. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, the thing is that you actually apply pressure by dealing 5 damage immediately and um, threatening the, you know, the health of your opponent with 5 damage every single turn, or even 7 if you evolve. And you set up a ward so your opponent cannot really attack your face directly. So it basically says that I hit you every turn and you cannot hit me. Something like, we have this Timeless Witch, right? Timeless Witch for Runecraft says that your face cannot be damaged. So you can attack your opponent's face directly and he is forced to trade. With Zeus, it's kind of the same thing. He, your opponent is forced to trade with your Zeus. Before he kills the Zeus, he's not able to go to your face. So Timeless Witch is played in some decks. And Zeus, of course, has the same effect basically, but for 6 more mana but has this storm and a lot more stats. The biggest weakness of Zeus is of course hard removal, which yeah. makes you always go behind on mana, because you spend 10 mana on this Zeus and your opponent kills it for 5 or even less. Mm -hmm. So the only deck I see that you can like, afford to play Zeus is the Ramp Dragon when mana is not a, not a problem for you. Yeah, the other thing I say is like, any deck that's playing like a cycle package, like I feel like ideally you want to play Triple Lucifer, Triple Bahamut. So could you play those and then play a Zeus on top of that? I feel like that might be too much. Like, is Zeus worth a deck slot in your deck? And is it worth a 10 play point slot? And I don't think that he is. I mean, if I open animated Zeus, I will build a dragon deck around <laughs> him. But if I don't open animated Zeus, I will probably not bother to craft it because... It's just not that good, unless we get proven wrong by some professional players. Maybe some, you know, some dragon players like Solek will actually find the value in it. I actually I mean, would love to ask Solek about this opinion. Like, if you want to go aggressive in Dragon for 10, you have Genesis with more damage, you know? like Yeah, it is. 
But, I don't know. I don't yeah, like it. Yeah, so let's compare. We basically have now this uh, triple ten drop in Dragon. We have Genesis, which is aggressive play, Bahamut, which is defensive play, and Zeus, which is in between play. Yeah. So, as you said, Jack of all trades. It's exactly in between. It can do both, but cannot do anything better than other cards. Right. And it's not like Genesis can't trade if he needs to either. He can. Yeah, of sometimes he even must. Part, but... Yeah, there's no word, so that's why I think Zeus is better defensive play than Bahamut. Right. But then again, it's better, as I said, defensive proactive play. When your opponent board is really tight on spot, then you probably prefer to play Zeus than Bahamut. Because if your opponent has the hard removal, they kill both Zeus and Bahamut. But Zeus got this 5 damage phase at least. True, but at the same time, like, Zeus kills one minion, Bahamut destroys the entire board and amulets, right? Yeah, sometimes it's a bad thing even, but most of the times it's a good thing. Like, you know, yeah. Lurching Corpse or the Tribunal of Good and Evil. Yeah. And on Arena, probably this versatility is exactly what Arena needs. Yeah, and Arena is just really good. I mean, you would take it over other not as good legendaries. How about Olivia? Would you take it over Olivia? No, I don't think so. I would actually heavily consider that because Arena is not that full of hard removal. I mean, he's, again, pretty good value, of course, like, I mean, it's good. 5 damage, 2 face can end the game. But I don't, I think uh, Olivia is still too good and Bahamut still as well. I wouldn't take this over uh, either of those. Would you take it over Genesis? Probably yes, right? No, probably not, to be honest. Because once I'm at that point, you want to just end the game, right? Huh, I see. I mean, maybe you could make an argument for it, depending on how your deck is, but... Yeah, if you have a lot of RAM, maybe Zeus is better. Yeah. Because you actually get to use it versus some more smorky decks like Sword. Genesis is not that useful versus Sword, unless you had solid early game. Yeah, so overall, would you say Zeus is better in Constructed or Arena? I'd say Arena. Yeah, I think I would agree with you here. Yeah. So guys, this was actually the last card for today. We, was, we were talking about one card for each class and one neutral card. We will probably keep this format for uh, future episodes. We'll be inviting different people. If you have any suggestion of who you want to see in this kind of video, uh, definitely leave a comment down below. I will be reading all the comments and probably will make your wishes come true. So, Louis, thank you very much for joining me today. It was a pleasure to record with you. I yeah. hope your streaming goes well. Thank you for the invite. And peace out, guys.